Virginia. All right. Welcome to the OG Networking Hour. Thanks for coming. Um, we're going to be talking today about how do you make money off your product. So, pretty important stuff. These are a series of lectures based on discipline entrepreneurship. It comes from MIT. Um, so far in the series, it, it's been who's your customer? What can you do for your customer? How does your customer acquire your product? And how do you make money off your product? So, when you think of these questions, this is kind of the stage that they're at. I don't think you need to have seen a lot of those other presentations um, to be able to get value out of this one. This one's really about your business model and options for uh, generating revenue from customers. The way discipline entrepreneurship works is that you've got a new startup, you've got an idea. The way you really make that happen is getting specific about who your customer is, what you're going to do, uh, what your product and service is going to be. And then by the end, when, once you, you, you've gotten really specific about that, it becomes tangible. And then that's how your business is going to become successful. All right, so we'll jump right into the, the topics about this theme. First one is uh, design a business model. The way they refer to it in the book, it's kind of more like a revenue model. The distinction there is a business model is how an organization creates, delivers, and captures value. The revenue model is how an organization captures value. So this one's really about that value capture piece. Um, we talk about this a lot. I think this is a really powerful thing to think about. When you start a new business, you don't need to innovate across everything. Um, you can focus on some specific pieces and differentiate there, and then gain an advantage without having to differentiate product across a lot of different things. The three main ways to do that, value creation, so you've got some innovative product or service. Value capture, you've got a unique revenue model that makes your product accessible to a different audience than other business models or revenue models. And then value delivery, so you've got something unique about the way you promote or distribute your product. And you see a lot of examples of businesses that innovate on one of these things and then basically just mimic other businesses across those other pieces. So I think this is really powerful here. The interesting thing is, oh, this is a good cartoon that kind of illustrates the point. You got amount of time spent on value innovation, so everybody wants to design new products and services, and then amount of time spent on value capture innovation. And it says, he thinks you need to get things in balance. Right? And the reason is, you know, it's, it's always cool to think about, I'm going to innovate on this product, I'm going to get a really unique service. When if you just tweak a business model, you can um, basically use an existing product or service and just make it more attractive to a specific target customer and make your, your product um, a lot more attractive. If you think of the classic example with uh, server hosting, um, where you've got, you know, the past model was you, you, you buy a server for a website and you own it. Um, same service then packaged up by Amazon Web Services or Rackspace, whoever was the first to do it, to buy a service on demand. Dramatically reduces the cost and makes it a lot more accessible for website hosting. So that's just a tweak in the, in the value capture, the way that uh, the revenue model works, um, without really changing the product or service, and that can be a really successful business. So that's a lesson here, and I think the, the big lesson on this step is really think about what could you do differently from a, with your revenue model to um, differentiate your business. So some key factors for choosing a revenue model for your business. First one's your customer. You really want to understand your customer needs. Value creation, how much value does your product provide and when? And this is going to inform ways you can capture value. Um, the competition is important. Um, you want to know what the competition is doing. And you really want to you know, consider, do customers like that revenue model that all the competitors are using? Is there some way to do it differently, like to get away from uh, penalty fees with Blockbuster, to go to uh, no late fees on Netflix? I mean, that was a, um, mainly a revenue model innovation that made that product a lot more successful than, uh, than the traditional model. Um, as far as distribution, you want to make sure your distribution channels have the right incentives for your product. and um, that plays into your revenue model based on who gets paid and when, do you have money to pay salespeople and things like that. Some different types of revenue models. First one would be a one-time fee up front, charge plus maintenance. I got a picture of some elevators here. Um, because a lot of times elevators are sold at a loss because the maintenance contracts are so lucrative. And so they've got this upfront fee, but really they're trying to make their money on the maintenance contracts. Because the switching costs are pretty high when somebody puts an elevator in. It's hard to take those out and plug in a new one. 
Um, cost plus, you know, just starting with what your costs are adding to it. We generally don't re recommend that one. Hourly rates, subscription, leasing model, licensing model. This is a chart here of Qualcomm revenue and operating income. Um, so you can see the blue one over here is the revenue from um, the hardware products, right? And then over here is the revenue from the licensing products. Then when you go to the right, the income from their licensing is basically just way, way higher. Well, they don't make as much revenue, it's much more profitable for them to do licensing. That's where they make the majority of their money. Uh, licensing out IP for it goes in cell phones and things like that. Uh, consumables, your razor and blade model, where you sell somebody a razor handle and they're on the hook to buy razors. So people tweak that model a little bit different ways. Um, you can upsell with high margin products. I always love this one on, with uh, Apple's iPhone, where they this is the clean hundred bucks between the 16 gigabyte, 32 gigabyte, and the 64 gigabytes. So you start thinking that this extra 32 gigabytes for only hundred bucks is a deal. But then you see you go to conferences and people are handing out gigabyte thumb drives for free. You know, I mean, the storage is not costing Apple hundred dollars to add that much. Right? That's an extremely high, high margin addition uh, for them. But the way they frame it, you know, makes customers think that that's a good thing, and it does add functionality to, to the to the phone. It's a really good lesson in value pricing. So they're pricing this based on the value, not this cost plus of what it costs them, and so they make a lot of money. And that's one of the reasons Apple's so profitable. Um, advertising could be a revenue model too. Right. Any questions on these ones? Any more examples? I have a comment with the uh, Apple iPhone. It's interesting because it's kind of a decision you have to make uh, with their technology up front because they don't allow you to go in and just add RAM or, or memory, right? You know, it's a closed system. So you know that memory would be great. Most other technology, you can just add memory later. They don't allow you to do that. They sort of just force you into, ah, do I want to have a lot of videos and photos? I guess I'll just flip out that extra 200 bucks initially, because mm -hmm. you know you're going to want it, but it just has to be made yeah. as a decision up front. Yeah. Those guys are clever. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so some more. Uh, reselling data collected or for temporary access. This has become a, a really attractive business model. Um, for some businesses, ways is it a billion dollars or two billion dollars that Google bought them for? So they crowdsource traffic information. That data was really valuable to Google. Ways doesn't have any other business model. They don't sell advertising or anything like that. They basically just have a really effective platform for gathering traffic data in real time. That's valuable to Google, and they're willing to pay billions and billions of dollars for it. So that can be a good model there. Transaction fees can also be a model usage-based, your cell phone plan, which is basically what it is, where maybe you get somebody in a, a low-cost device, but then there's expensive monthly fees going on after that. This parking meter penalty charge business model was used by Blockbuster. Customers hate that. So if you ever see an industry that uses penalty fees as a way to uh, monetize their services, is there some way to uh, differentiate against that? You see the only businesses that are able to use it our parking departments that have a monopoly on a specific area, so there's no way that somebody else can come in really and, and differentiate. You know, you, I, don't, I don't think you can set up your own parking lot on NMSU campus, <laughs> circumvent the parking fees. So they, they've got a monopoly in a way that they can use that business model. Uh, microtransactions, we've got a Studio G client, Big Santhropy, that does uh, a little bit of money on, on microtransactions. The Steam game engine is really popular. Uh, you can buy games for a dollar, you know, a couple dollars here and there. And so, based on their scale, those microtransactions get pretty lucrative. And I think Steam just takes a piece of each one of the sales. Uh, credit cards use microtransactions a lot. Shared savings. Um, this Amresco, it's not a really well-known company, um, but one of the things they do is they set up these, they're called energy performance service contracts. Right? And so what they do is they provide the upfront fees to do uh, energy audits. They'll save energy in the future. And then based on those savings, then they get paid. Right? So it's a really clean sell to, to a customer because they're not having to come out of pocket for anything. They only get paid when they actually save the money. Um, and, and that can be a pretty attractive model. 
because it's attractive to a business to sign up for something like that. Franchise models, I just put, there's a lot of these, but batteries and bulbs is a pretty effective franchise. And then you think about what makes that franchise good is that batteries and bulbs don't usually expire, right? So you can carry a lot of inventory, it doesn't, uh, and there's a room for um, high margin on some specialty bulbs and batteries, and that, that can be a really profitable franchise. Operating a maintenance contract could be, could be your business model. Any questions on these ones? Any examples? I think there's a one, one related to shared savings would be just like a performance-based scenario where maybe for a minimal fee or for no fee at all, you could, uh, as a business, take the risk to go ahead and do some work up front mm -hmm. and then uh, make your profit off the actual effectiveness of what it is that you've done. Say, for example, like a promotional campaign. Mm -hmm. You can do a promo free promotional campaign for a business, but you generate X percent of mm -hmm. The proceeds. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good example. And usually, the key to that is some way to track Perform, yeah, performance right. really cleanly. Um, and then, if you have a compelling service that you can track that way, you probably can make more money using a model like that. Um, yeah. Because they're more, you no know, business would be more willing to share the price when they get uh, additional revenue. Or once you've done it a couple times and they've seen how much money they're paying you, yeah. they'll, maybe they'll be willing to pay you more money up front. Yeah. To not, to not, you know, have to pay a, a portion of the process. That's true. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a, a pretty powerful model, especially for service mm -hmm. service businesses. Um, so some summaries on revenue models. You can capture value in an infinite number of ways. These are important decisions that really affect your profitability. So you really want to take some time and, and consider. Is the revenue model you, ch you chose the, the best one for your business? And is it a way? Is there a way to differentiate your industry based on your revenue model? Because that's some of the lowest cost innovation you can do. Whereas you know, new product or new, new service may take a lot of design and testing and things like that. The revenue model is basically just changing your website or your sales sheet or just the terms of your operation. So always look to these as ways to differentiate. Um, it's not impossible, but it is difficult to change when somebody associates your business with a specific revenue model. Maybe difficult to change, so definitely do your homework on this one. All right, so a question. Can you guys think of a product or service that only became an option for you because of a new revenue model? <clears throat> so would Dollar Shave Club be an example of this? Where at for, or before you had to go down to the store and buy the Razor, whatever, but now you're buying the razor monthly uh, based off su subscription. Mm -hmm. Would that be like yeah? That? So if that made a difference to you, and all of a sudden now this is a you know rather than using electric razor, now you use blades because you've got this different model or something. Like that. mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an example. That was a pretty uh, disruptive business model, and a good example of basically you got the exact same product, still razors. But just a different business model made it um, really helped its customer cost of the acquisition because it's something unique that they can promote based on. Um, it was a new idea, and it really attacked an industry that I mean, for a long time, the razor blade model is always like that's the way it is. So that's a great company. They really it's really profitable, and they found a way to differentiate uh, with a revenue model and have a competitive business. So, I think an interesting one is uh, Microsoft, their Office Suite has mm -hmm. changed their revenue model it's with the appearance of like Google's tools and some of the other like Chromebooks and things that are the cloud. not, yeah, they're not using the uh, full Office Suite anymore, so they made it to a subscription base instead of having to buy that license outright, you can buy it for the term of the year or whatever. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Adobe, I mean, you used to have to buy like the Master Suite or the Adobe Photoshop or whatever, piecemeal, and then you owned it though forever and you want burdened down by like regular updates or anything and you had your workflow all in place but but now the benefit of paying a monthly subscription is you have access to all of their uh, software applications you know yeah every single one so that's that's nice uh, I think the uh, the shared hosting was huge it allowed me to get into like uh, developing websites and hosting websites and things for folks versus having a machine sitting in my in my office that you know has to have maintenance and things of that nature. 
Wix as well. I mean, yeah. that's a game changer, you know. Yeah. I mean, you're not having to use Dreamweaver or, or code by hand and just go in there and drag things around. That's huge. Yeah, so then instead of, um, I mean, that gets into some product innovation, but instead of having to pay for hosting separate from the design services, you get that all at once. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot, lot more attractive. Than I think the, um, they're all related, right? I mean, if you change your delivery system, then you're probably going to have an opportunity to change your method of uh, generating revenues, right? And vice versa and stuff like the, the whole Netflix thing. I mean, their channel of delivery was the internet, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to the to the store, or what have you. But yeah. also at that same time, I mean, they were able to innovate on their subscription method and such. Yeah. Because they changed the, the delivery channel. Mm -hmm. That's true. All right. All right. Next one, we're going to talk about pricing frameworks. So, you know, your pricing framework. You want to think of this uh, kind of as a moving target. Um, you're really trying to hone in on the ideal uh, price. We're not. Where you, where you maximize profits is really what you're controlling for. Um, this pricing is going to vary with market feedback. You want to iter iterations of different price points are going to inform you as to what's going to be the most profitable way to price your product. And then also think of this as an ongoing process. All right. The key, key thing we generally recommend is to price your product based on its value rather than your cost. Because that's going to allow you to differentiate and then capture more of the value that you provide with your product. The decision-making unit and the processes to acquire the paying customers impact your pricing point. So really understand who's going to be making the decisions to buy this product and then how that's going to impact your price point. You want to understand the prices of alternatives as well. That's really important. All right, so here's some other like, pretty complicated charts, but really the, the message here is that pricing strategies should be different for different customers at different stages. So this is a product adoption lifecycle. It shows how people <coughs> adopt products. And you can see this over and over again. With new products, usually they follow this pattern. Where you start with some innovators, technology enthusiasts that just want the newest thing. They're willing to take something that may not be totally finished in order to get some new technology. Then you've got early adopters. And then you got this big jump with this, uh, the chasm. This comes from a book called Crossing the Chasm. Um, and then you get into majority, early majority, and, and kind of a mainstream market. And as you go through these phases, your pricing is going to change a little bit. At first, people are willing to pay, they're not as price sensitive because they want something unique, they want some new technology. As you get to mainstream, then it, it may have to come down a little bit. So generally, you want to price your product higher at the beginning. And you see a lot of this with you know, new HD TVs. At first, when they come out, are really high on the price list down as it goes through that product adoption life cycle. Another way to look at it down here is um, based on how good the technology works, right? So there's kind of a threshold of when consumers think technology is good enough, right? So HD is good enough, we don't need ultra HD. And at that point, uh, once you get this good enough, then consumers start looking for the low cost option. Right? Well, they're still like, this could be better. They're willing to pay a lot of money to get that newest technology. Once you cross that threshold, then uh, it becomes more of a commodity. So that's another thing to think about, too. In general, you want to be flexible with early adopters of your, of your product um, because they can be evangelists for your product. Um, and there's not as many of them, so they may be willing to high, pay a higher price. So you can customize them products and things for that for them. Once you get to mainstream, then it's going to be a standardized product. It's always easier to lower prices than raise them. So you want to start with a high price and then come down. You want to understand the demand curve for your product. So here we've got some different demand curves. Anybody seen demand curves before? All right, so when you look at these, what's different about them? So on the y-axis, we've got Price and the bottom we've got quantity, and then these are demand uh, from consumers at different price and quantity points. So they're all different slopes, right? So what that is signaling 
is how consumers behave as you change price. And the term for this is elasticity. So when you see this, this is elastic. As the price goes down, more people are willing to buy the product. Right? That makes sense. Cheaper, you know, as the price goes down in general, um, the market for it becomes bigger. Think of this, this demand curve is a curve of willing and able buyers. Right? So many people, more people may want the product, but they may not be able. So anyway, willing and able buyers here. When you go over to this one here, this one's inelastic. And the reason for that is that you see price changing a lot here, but quantity is not changing a lot. And so you can think of things like cigarettes, people may be addicted to them, and you can change the price and people are still gonna buy them. That's an inelastic market. If there's something that people have to have that's not price sensitive, then that, that's pretty inelastic. And then you've got some that are very inelastic as the price changes, demand changes a lot. All right, so then the reason you want to think about this for your product is how much could you change the price um, without really impacting consumer behavior? If you've got an inelastic market, you should charge a higher price because you can. And the reason why that price becomes so important, um, I can show you the next slide. Another thing about it that I want you to be aware of in these demand curves is what happens when you get to this point when something becomes free. Because all these, this is you know, 100 bucks, 10 bucks, zero bucks. What happens at zero? What's the difference between a penny and a free product? In terms of how many people are gonna wanna use that product? Not really that much. Hmm? Yeah. Well, it depends. Yeah, it, it, it really depends the product. Yeah. yeah. Because sometimes, I mean, people see a free product and they might think it's attractive, it's free. Sometimes free is what makes it accessible. You know, imagine if, if every time somebody signed up for Facebook, they had to pay a penny. Right? That'd probably be a pretty big barrier to entry, right? Yeah. Right? I mean, how many of you guys want to take out your credit card and pay a penny <coughs> every time you create a social media account? So what you, did, what you want to think about is what happens at that free price point. Because if you can, by making a product free, could you get a substantially more amount of users? Could you go from 100 users to 100 million users? At which point, other revenue models become available. If you think a little about that, like for example, uh, sometimes you can go to Walmart and you can go to the dollar store, and in Walmart you will find something at two, three dollars, and in the dollar store you, you will find the same product at one dollar. So why people choose still choose to go to Walmart? to buy the same product when they can have it for cheaper. Like, that is cheaper doesn't mean that, doesn't exactly mean that more people will want to have that one. No, like people have different behavior, people have different perceptions about what the price and what the product is depending on the store and depending on the price and all that, so. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, convenience weighs a big factor. Um, Prices between stores, how far apart they are, and what else you can get while you're there. Um, the and I mean, every every grocery store. store. What's that? The fame, the fame of the store. The fame, yeah. But some, yeah, some folks uh, knowing you pay more for the exact same item that you get at Walmart, mm -hmm. uh, and while shopping at Target or Albertsons or elsewhere, mm -hmm. because they don't want to shop at Walmart. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Not only you can say convenience because like. People who store, stay nearby here goes to Walmart. Might be the quality, you know, like for three dollars we get a better quality than what we buy in the dollar tree. That might be one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of lot of factors here, yeah. <coughs> definitely. Um, on this free one, this usually comes up on the internet. You know, with internet-based businesses, you see the ones that are able to achieve massive scale usually don't have upfront fees to join and, and things like that. So you just want to be aware of. What's gonna happen for your product? Say you were to make it free. And if you were to make it free, could you reach a scale that opens up some different revenue models? Could you share, share data um, like Waze? Or, or could you monetize based on advertising at that point? All right, All right so um, now we're gonna talk about some initial pricing strategies. We'll talk about it in the next uh, section about lifetime value of your customer. So the reason that's important is you're looking at your customer as, a, an, as an asset um, that can bring you cash flows this year or maybe some point in the future. And 
the rule of thumb here is that the uh, long-term value of your customer should be three times the cost of acquiring that customer. So then when you think about pricing, you want to think about how much it's costing you to acquire each customer and factor that into your pricing. You want to find a balance between max revenue and then the max number of customers because you really want to maximize profits. And then over time, you adjust pricing to maximize profits. Now, this is what I was talking about, why this price is so important. For a company with an 8% profit margin, a 1% increase in sales yields an 11% increase in profit. All right, so you think of moving, uh, say it's a $100 product, you make an 8% margin, so $8 per product. That product goes up to $101, that may seem like a pretty small jump, but it expands your profit by 11%, which is pretty significant. So you really want to think about all those different ways that you can increase price without having a big fall off in, in users. Um, here's another example. Uh, $1,000 sales price, so you've got a product that has a $1,000 sales price, $250 profit. Say this is a service business. Say you're able to double your sales price to $2,000. Your profit would expand five times to $1,250. Then you want to ask the question, could you attract one of your five current customers to pay down? You can say it's a service business, you're doing websites or something like that. There's a big difference between having to build five websites and one website, right? But by changing your price, you can make the same amount of money to do both of those things. Right? So then you really want to think about is there room to move your price up? And is it worth sacrificing some additional customers to have a higher profit margin? Because that's really why you're running the business is to, to make profit. Um, this chart kind of shows out based on different sales price increases and your current profit margin, how much um, your, your profit margin is going to grow based on these changes. So if you get a 1% sales price increase with a 5% profit margin, that's a 19% increase in income. That's a significant jump. If you think of getting a 19% raise a year, I mean, that's, that's pretty good there. And so these small jumps can really have big impacts. A 5% raise on a 5% profit margin is a 90% increase in your profits. Those can be really significant. So really consider how you can raise your price. A lot of times, um, people's gut instinct that with the business, if you know you need to bring in more customers or something like that, is the lower prices. You just think that's going to bring people in. Really, it can eat away at your profit margin and make the, the business dramatically less profitable. The more you can enforce a high price or even raise it, um, the more money you'll make. If you can do it without turning away customers. Yeah. But now, that 90%, 19% of the 5% now is, you will end up having a 24% revenue or you will end up having a 5.9, I think that 0 0.9 is the 19% of five revenue. Um, well, so let's say just do a hundred bucks. If you go up from a hundred bucks, you'd make $5 profit. You increase that 5%, then you make $10 profit. All right, so it's almost doubling. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So you increase the 5% and you get those 90%, that is 90% compared to the 5% 90% growth over what you're making before. Okay. Yep. Any questions on this? I, when I did the math, this kind of surprised me. Um, but I mean, this this stat right here, I mean, this people this kind of blows people's mind when they hear it. But it really indicates how important it is to keep your prices up. All right. So, the question on this one: In what situations as a startup should you compete on price? You have uh, something that gives you barrier to entry with significantly low, lower costs, but, mm -hmm. but it's a trick question. Yeah. Well, <laughs> in the answer, in most cases, never. Right? You really don't want to be competing on, on price. You want to be competing on value. And so, if you do have a barrier to entry in a way to pr produce something way lower, then you're probably better off just matching the market and then capturing your cost advantage to a higher profit. Uh, and then as a startup, it's really difficult to have a scale to compete on price. So you think of, there's two types of business uh, to, of competitive advantage. You've got cost leadership and differentiation. And you really should only, you, you can only choose one. 
when you think of the ones that are able to compete on cost leadership, it's like Walmart, who's got logistics and infrastructure all over the country that allow them to price their products low. You couldn't just start a company and be able to compete with them on price. You'd have to differentiate in some way. So in general, as a startup, you always want to price based on value and you always want to try to compete on differentiation. Any questions on that? All right. Uh, this is probably the most math heavy chapter of almost all our presentations, I think, but it's pretty informative. It's about calculating the lifetime value of an acquired customer. And so this is like the dollar value of each new customer that you acquire. Ideally, this should be higher than your cost to acquire the customer, right? Because think of the cost to acquire the customer as your cost of getting into an investment, and then this lifetime value is what you get in return. So you always want that cost to be lower than what you, the value you get. All right. So this is based on net present value, so the time value of money. The easy way to think about that is a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow, is worth more than a dollar next year. Right? So dollars in the future, we discount them back um, and value them less than, than the dollars we get sooner. The discount of free, free cash flows is um, you discount them to calculate what they're worth today, and then the discount rate is based on your current cost of financing. To include uh, for your lifetime value calculation, one-time revenue streams, recurring revenue streams, additional revenue opportunities, the gross margin for each revenue stream, the retention rate, life of the product, and the next product purchase rate, and the cost of capital. Um, business model plays a key role in what this lifetime value turns out to be. Lifetime value is all about profit, not, not revenue. This is about what your company gets from each customer that it requires. Overhead costs need to be considered, gross margins, retention rates. Finding additional upselling opportunities can significantly improve profit and lifetime value. So if you're able to sell somebody a higher margin product, say the 32 gigabyte iPhone that you make 95 extra dollars on, um, that, can, that, can be, that can really enhance the, your profit and also the lifetime value of customers. All right, so simple pieces here. Add up the expensive revenues expenses to serve a single customer and then discount that revenue back based on the cost of capital. So I'll show you how to do that too. All right, so an example here, got a one-time revenue of $10,000 for an initial sale. Recurring revenue uh, is maintenance charges, 15% of the purchase price getting up to six months and then $1,500 bucks a year. This example doesn't have any additional revenue opportunities. You make 65% on the initial sale, 85% on maintenance sales. The retention rate is 100% first year and then 90% per year after that. Next product purchase rate is 75%. Because the remaining customers buy version two after year five. So when we get down to this, you can see these are all, this is time zero, so, so at the time of sale, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. You got the price of the product, so you make 10,000 bucks. Your uh, margin on that 65%, so your profit is 6,500. Price of the maintenance contract was a percentage that first year, so you make 75 bucks there. 100% retention in the first rate, first year. Then uh, gross margin for maintenance. And basically you've got all these profits. Um, and this assumes a cost of capital of 50%, so in a startup, um, it could be really high because you're paying um, investors High returns on equity if you succeed. So you got this in the first year, and then year two, you calculate similar things, and you discount that back at that rate. So then what you get is the net present value of your profits down here at the bottom. So if this was, so your, your lifetime value of the customer is 9,500 bucks. We wanted to say um, lifetime value needs to be three times our cost of customer acquisition. How much could we spend on the cost of customer, to, to acquire a customer? Uh, final price times three. Um, divided by three. So you, you're willing to spend three thousand dollars to acquire this customer that's worth ninety five hundred. So you always want that cost to the, the your cost of acquiring a customer to be less than the, what the customer is worth. So if they, you think about that. Pay three thousand bucks and you get something that's worth ninety five hundred bucks. That's a profitable thing to do. Right? Now, if it costs you 
ten thousand dollars to acquire a customer, this business probably wouldn't work, right? Because you'd lose money on each each customer you acquire. So you'd have to do something different with your business model or the way you acquire customers. Any questions on this? It's kind of complicated template, but you really want to think through these about all the different ways your business makes money um, to then figure out how much is each customer worth. Because then you can make an educated guess or decision on how much you can spend at par, whether you do direct selling or you need to sell them through social media or something like that. All right, so the general idea of the step is to value your customer like an investment uh, based on the specific cash flows you earn from them. Properly valuing your customer can make you, help you make important decisions about customer acquisition strategies. So why is it important to understand the value of your customers? If you can't make enough money off them, then you're not in business. Yeah, that's true. Um, any other methods you guys are used to value customers? To figure out how much they're worth, how much you can spend on advertising your apartment? Mm -hmm. Usually it's going to boil back to how much money you can make off their customer. So you really want to have a good method for doing that. Alright, next steps to calculate the cost of customer acquisition, the COCA. Very critical to get an accurate representation of this. Although it's challenging, it's going to be fundamental to your business. You need to pay attention to the details. The COCA is how much it costs to acquire one new paying customer. COCA versus the customer lifetime value is really what you're, you're kind of weighing against each other. The key question is how long before COCA is less than long-term value? So okay if it costs you more to acquire your first customers, the idea is this COCA should come down as your lifetime value comes up because you're profitable over here, you're losing money over here. And so decreasing COCA over time is the key to, to developing a stable business. All right, so there's two ways to do it, uh, bottom up and top down. Um, top down is you take all your all your costs for a specific period and you divide it amongst how many customers you acquired. That's the most accurate, but you need to have had an operating history. Bottom up is you start adding up all your costs. And the reason that's challenging is because it's really easy to leave out costs unless people are really good cost accounts. So some ways to decrease COCA, because this is really what you want to do. As soon as you can decrease COCA, you can, uh, you can expand your profits. So direct sales, for, so switching from direct sales uh, direct sales from telemarketing to social media can be cheaper. And that's a way to reduce COCA. Automate the marketing outreach process. You have higher conversion rates on sales that will reduce COCA too. The cost and quality of leads, um, some making it cheaper to generate leads and also getting higher quality leads is gonna lower your COCA. Because say, you gotta talk to 100 people to make one sale, that's more expensive than talking to 10 people to make one sale. Enhancing word of mouth really helps. Uh, making the sales funnel shorter so you can convert people to sales quicker can reduce the cost. Choosing a business model that's easy to sell is important. So that one example of the business that fronts the upfront cost and then makes money on the uh, performance of their product is probably a much easier model to sell than saying, give me $100,000 up front and then you'll make the money back over two years or something like that. So picking a business model that's going to be easy to, for you to sell to customers is going to help you out too. It's going to make it easier for your salespeople to convert. Um, and really having a good target market allows you to target people that are more likely to be your buyers. So the key way, takeaway here is to make COCA real rather than what you want it to be. So really think about what it could be and then think about how you can reduce it. Any questions on this? Um, here's some examples of how you can use different strategies to reduce your COCA and attract customers um, at a lower cost. You see a lot of businesses are able to, to grow fast by having a low COCA because they can just invest in these low cost methods and attract uh, more customers. One of the ways you do that is through inbound marketing, which is basically like uh, you offer stuff on your website that brings people in. And once they're accessing stuff on your site, getting information from it, then they're a lot easier to convert to a customer than if you solicit them as a customer first. 
So there's a company called Moz that does uh, search engine optimization products and consulting. And they do a lot of guides and things like that, like the beginner's guides to search engine optimization. So they're free resources, they help people get into that. And all these guides are tailored to people that are probably their customer. Somebody that wants to read this guide on how to do search engine optimization probably is interested in search engine optimization tools. So they're able to get people on the site because they've got something of value, and then from there they can market market to them later. So they're not spending any money other than the cost of this content creation. Once they have that fixed asset, it's going to be there, uh, and it continues to bring in new, new people. Usually these require some sign up for a mailing list, so then they have a way to market to you later. And then you can go into email marketing, which is pretty low cost uh, to con convert people later. Here's another example. This is the fill out your email address and, and business name um, to get access to this this book uh, for business to business referrals. This is from a company that does um, advocate marketing. So somebody is interested in getting more business to business referrals, probably wants some of these products that this advocate marketing for himself. That's another good example. The word of mouth. So we talked about Dollar Shave Club. Have you guys seen this before? This is the one that kind of made the business famous. But I don't know how many views, there's several million views. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, Papa! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are going to ship them right to you. Just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So, th this video put it out when the company was just coming out, and uh, people shared it like crazy. It was, it was funny and really clearly articulates what their, their, their business does. It's a unique business model, got a lot of people sign up, and it's a really profitable uh, marketing tool. There's another one, um, I don't know if you guys have seen this, with uh, Blend Tech blenders. So this guy does, he, he makes high-end blenders. What blend? That is the question. That will blend anything, right? trouble deciding which new phone to get? Nah, neither are we. But we have two phones here, and some people are telling me they're having a hard time making up their mind. So, I am going to help them out. Are we ready? Lumia? 929? Nobody wants that. Here, the Galaxy Note 3. And over here, seems like this larger size doesn't want to come out. Ah, the iPhone 6 Plus. I think I'll press the Newton button. And over here, I think I'll press the who's copying who button. <laughs> I was able to do these for a lot of different products, but it basically just costs them cost whatever product he puts in there, right? And he blends it, and then people find it entertaining, and they share it, and it gets the name. So there you go. 
gets six points. Of views. <laughs> so, but he gets millions of views on, on on stuff like this, right? And it's showing you how effective his blender is. You can even blend an iPhone, so it should be able to blend the smoothie or whatever else you're going to put into it. Um, and so, to be able to differentiate in the blender space, which is probably pretty competitive, um, is, is pretty unique. And he's able to do it because he's got a unique take on marketing um, at a really low cost of customer acquisition because people um, share this to each other for free. All right, so think of a product or service you purchased, and then can you take a guess of how much money did the business spend to acquire you? McDonald's. Okay. So they've been spending money since you were a baby to convince you that McDonald's is the place to eat, right? Yeah. And Superboy ads and everything, so they yeah. spend a lot of money okay. for my $1. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you spent a lot of $1 at McDonald's, yeah. right? Okay. That's a good example. Any others? I bought a product called Fiberfix. It was a commercial similar to the one from Dollar Shave Club. And like same name uh, of commercial, made me laugh for like five minutes straight. I saw it at Home Depot, so I bought it. But uh, I have no use for it right now. It's a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But yeah, you know, they, they 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 did it. Drove a car off a cliff, so they probably spent at least a few grand on the yeah. commercial, but they had millions of views, so I'm sure it was a fraction of a penny on that. Yeah, so that's a good example. With those videos, I mean, it's a one time investment, and then it should continue to bring in users after that. And we can laugh in my case. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that always helps. Any others? I think really thinking about um, a lot of businesses, they don't even have a person interact with you for you to make a purchasing decision, right? So there's not a salesperson that needed to sell you uh, fiber fix. You know, show you a video, get you excited about the product, make you laugh, and then you go buy it. That's really where you eventually want to get to, that part where it's decreasing the cocoa over time where you may be direct selling your product at first, but ideally you get it to where it's aut automated. Somebody can go to Amazon and they, you know, sell themselves on the product and then they buy it and you make money. So over time, keep trying to figure out ways that you can automate that sales process so you can make more money. And use the times when you're doing direct sales as a way to gather information about the customers about how you can refine that sales channel and make it simpler so then eventually you can automate it. So that's the way to use those. Direct sales are going to be expensive. you got an individual talking to somebody to sell them. Uh, is there a way you can learn from that to then basically automate that in the future so people don't need to be personally sold. All right, so if you get nothing else, choosing a revenue model is a differentiation opportunity. You should really look at it that way. Innovation in this area is way easier than product innovation. It's also a lot more low cost. You want to price to maximize profits. You want to understand what your customers are worth, and this informs how much you can spend to acquire them. And then also it informs what distribution channels are available to you. You know, if your lifetime value of a customer is, um, 30 bucks, you may not be able to have a personal salesperson sell them something that might take an hour or something like that. Um, but if it's uh, you know a lot higher, then you may be able to direct sell them. So that's really how much that customer is worth is really going to dictate how much you can spend to acquire them. And I remember uh, general like a Facebook customer is worth 30 bucks. So if they can get you to sign up for less than 30 bucks, that's a good, good investment. Right, so you want to think about those type of things because then you also don't want to leave uh, money on the table. Like if, you, if you've got a really valuable customer, um, it's worth making an investment to, to bring them on board. And that's why you see like Uber and Lyft really running a lot of campaigns to try to bring people on the platform, free $20 gift cards. That's their cost of customer acquisition. They get you on the platform and then they think they can make more than that over time. All right. So any questions? Alright, were the wings good? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. These are always my favorite when we get to bring these. So. <laughs> We've got, uh, it's the Facebook Live people missed that, missed out on the wings this time. I uh, just want to do a couple promo opportunities here, just make everybody aware about the Aggie Startup Club. This is a kid, uh, a club for students interested in entrepreneurship. You can sign up at arrowheadcenter.msu.edu slash startup. And I meet twice a month. It's a really good networking opportunity. 
uh, to meet other students interested in entrepreneurship. Um, and then next week we're doing a, this is a really good networking hour on Traction. It's a book about 19 ways uh, businesses get customers. The title of it is How to Get Customers. Um, and it goes through basically all these different ways businesses use to, to acquire customers and it talks about a systematic way for figuring out the right channel for your business. So that's a really good talk. Hope to see you next week. And also we've got uh, all our events on Facebook so you can subscribe to those there. You can watch this event uh, live on our Facebook Live will be on the website too. So thanks for coming.